The uh, concept of Crash TV more or less came out of a necessity because it originated at a time uh, when Raw and Nitro were going head to head and we couldn't give the television viewer an opportunity to change the channel and see what the competition was doing. So we knew that Raw needed to be a very quick paced, action paced, uh, more or less cutting edge in your face to not give the viewer the opportunity to turn the channel over to the competition. Crash TV was a concept that evolved uh, during our time in WWF. Uh, what we were trying to do and everything that we did at that point was uh, catch the viewer by surprise, catch the audience by surprise, uh, never let them relax, never let them think they knew what was going to happen next. And Crash TV was a big part of that. You never knew when we were going to break into a segment with something backstage. You never knew when something was going to happen that was going to take our attention away from what was going on in the ring uh, and basically launch other storylines as a result of that. Uh, it was really, really popular at the time that we did it because of the simple fact that everything that had been done up till that point was very old school. It was very staid and boring. Uh, to a certain extent. And what we were trying to do was trying to get away from that, trying to get away from the aspect of wrestling that people thought they knew, the fans thought they knew everything that was going to happen before it happened. Um, now, like with everything else that you see, too much of a good thing isn't a good thing. Uh, I, I, I feel that we did a little bit too much of it in WCW. Um, and as a result of that, the fans kind of got desensitized to it. Uh, with anything like this that's designed to shock and throw the audience off guard and throw them off balance, the, the, the shock comes from the fact that it's a surprise. We're not expecting it. But if we do too much shock TV, if we do too much crash TV, um, then it loses its primary uh, influence, which is to surprise. If you're expecting there to be an interruption, then you're not going to be surprised when it happened. If you're expecting there to be some sort of, of uh, heavy deal going down behind the scenes, it's, it's not going to have the desired effect. You need to have uh, a form of stasis. You need to have uh, uh, things to be normal in order to have a surprise have any impact. Um, if you have nothing but surprises, well, then they're not surprises anymore. So what you need to do is you need to lull the audience into a sense of complacency and then hit them with a surprise. Uh, it reminds me just uh, uh, something to illustrate this concept was one of the things that we kind of got into a rut with um, was we had a lot of run-ins during matches. Um, and we were using these to, to further storylines. Um, and we did a lot of crash TV with that as well. But... I remember at one point in WCW, I think this was at a point when I was, when I was on the committee without Vince, uh, we realized that we were doing far too much of it. And what we did was we tried to reinstitute law and order. And we had it so that uh, anybody who interfered in any match that wasn't theirs, we set down the rule uh, storyline wise, anybody who interfered in any match uh, would, there would be pu punished severely. They would be suspended, they would be fined. I forget exactly what the punishment was, but it was su sufficient enough that we got away with not having anybody interfering in any matches. And we went on for only about three weeks. Um, and this was on Nitro and Thunder. So you had two shows, it was six shows that we did this, that we established this rule and kept it in effect. And not, you know, it wasn't that much time, but then the fourth week, we had a match going on. I don't even remember what the match was, but I remember who did it. Uh, we had Shane Douglas run down to the ring and interfere in the end of the match. And after only four weeks of not having any interruptions in the matches, this was the first time that anybody had seen it. There was an audible gasp from the crowd. It was a big deal that Shane Douglas came down. They weren't expecting it. So something as simple as that, if you pull back on the surprises, you pull back on the shock, it makes the, the shocks and surprises mean so much more when you, when you deliver them, as opposed to if you're delivering them willy-nilly.
Um, I had seen ECW, and I, 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 to be honest with you, I caught maybe three or four shows. Um, but one thing I was really impressed by was, was the energy level. And another thing I was impressed by was the reality of what was going on in the ring. Um, these weren't the same matches that I had seen, you know, in my teens or in my 20s or the same wrestling matches that you had seen over and over again. Um, there was some reality. There, there was some athletes in that ring really taking risks. So if I took anything from ECW and brought it to the WWF, it, it was just the in-ring action and, and, and the level at which the athletes performed at. I was a huge ECW fan um, back in mid-90s, 95, 96, 97, around there. Um, and to the point where this is when I was working in Los Angeles and I was a writer, producer for TV. And I, uh, you know, obviously ECW was an East Coast thing, but I went out of my way to, this was before mini dish satellites were all over the place. And there was this company called Prime Star that would rent you the mini dish satellite, kind of like a cable provider, only they provided mini dish. And I ordered Prime Star and I got Prime Star for my cable provider because they offered uh, Fox Sports Network and MSG, which broadcast ECW TV. So I went to this expense just so I could get to see the ECW TV shows. I would order the tapes all the time. Uh, so as a fan, I was a huge fan of ECW. Um, one of the main reasons is the fact that at that time, um, as we discussed before, the, the WWF's product was um, suffering badly. Um, the, the, the writing had not improved and the WWF, to me as a fan, even though I was a loyalist, I had watched WWF ever since I was a kid, um, and growing up in the Northeast, I was strictly a WWF fan. Um, they they just they were hurting big time and it was it was a hard time to be a fan of the WWF ECW on the other hand even though there was this small ragtag outfit they were putting out some of the most compelling wrestling programming I had ever seen they were the ones to me who really began the redefinition of the business and started to to create their programming and write their shows aimed at an intelligent fan, taking into account the fact that the fans grow up, whereas at the time the WWF to me was still appealing to kids as well as trying to appeal to adults. But ECW had a mature, violent, grown-up approach that was refreshing. I didn't feel like I was being insulted when I was watching ECW's programming. Um, and it had a profound influence on me as uh, at that time I was also, I was wrestling in Indies in Southern California and it had a huge influence on the way that I, the way that I, I worked in the ring and the way that I thought about my matches. Um, and going from then on to when I went into the WWF and started working with Vince McMahon and Vince Russo and just the way that, that ECW had established what you could do um, for me personally, I, let, I, I loved that so much that I wanted to bring that same feeling to the kind of storylines we were doing in the WWF. So for me personally, uh, huge debt to, to ECW. I, I think without ECW, um, the business would be very different right now. And uh, who knows what it would be, but I think that it would be a very, very different business today if ECW hadn't exploded like it did. One of the reasons why I broke into the wrestling business, you know, some 13, 14 years ago is because I started at, at the independent level. And um, I myself, I went to wrestling school in Brooklyn at Johnny Rods, the unpredictable Johnny Rods, his school of wrestling. And I never wanted to become a wrestler. I just wanted to learn the ins and the outs of the business. So I went there more or less to get educated. The one thing that really appealed me to the business and the, and the one reason that really cemented me wanting to make a living in this business was uh, I, I had a friend and there was a guy by the name of Vito LaGrasso. His name is Big Vito. And when I saw Vito breaking into the business, when I saw him down at Gleason's gym, 
Um, I saw the heart and the determination and the blood and the sweat and the tears. And I saw a young kid giving everything he possibly could to make that dream become a reality. And there were a lot of people at that level that, 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 that worked on just pure guts and determination and the love of the sport alone. There was a lot of heart in it. And um, that made me realize that this was the business I wanted to be in. Unfortunately, you know, when my dream came true and I reached the level of success, you know, in the WWF, um, it was something completely different. And, and the one thing that I noticed was it wasn't about heart anymore. There was no heart. And, and in my opinion, the heart was gone. It was now a different business. It was, it was a business and it was a lot of politics and a lot of power plays and it wasn't about the raw love that, that drew me into the business. So, you know, my advice to somebody out there is there's a lot of you out there that have good intentions and that love the business and that really want to make it into the business that aren't going to make it in the business. But the reality of it is it has nothing to do with your ability because right now you're probably just as good as anybody that's there and you probably have the skills to, 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 to make it to the big league. But there's a lot more to it than that. Um, you've got to change. Uh, you know, uh, as I stated in the interview, it's very hard to be a good person and be in the wrestling business. And I know I myself, I, I had to sell out. And, and I had to change just to be able to exist in that business. It's a very tough world. Uh, it's dog eat dog and you're constantly wa watching your back and, and as a person, you have to change and you more or less have to become something you're not. And I really believe that a lot of young kids don't make it in the business because I don't think they were supposed to. And I don't think that was the plan that, that, that God had in mind when you were created. Um, and my advice is stay true to your heart and listen to your heart and follow your heart. And if you see you're becoming something that you know you really aren't, I mean, I could tell you firsthand it, it, it's not worth it because that's what happened to me. Um, you know, I followed the dream. I followed the money. Um, I followed my own self-glorification. And I did a lot of things for a lot of the wrong reasons. And it, it changed me as a person. Um, as I said, I don't know where I would have been headed. Um, all I could tell you is that I was desperate. Um, I was um, depressed. Um, I wasn't happy and all the money in the world couldn't have made me happy. And, um, you know, as I stated earlier, it wasn't until I got a wake-up call um, from the person who created me that made me take a long look at myself and made me take a look at my heart and, and who the person was that he created. And, and once I realized that and once I got a clear vision, I just realized that the wrestling business was no longer for me. So, um, you know, again, all I'm saying is be true to yourself and stay true to yourself because there's going to be nothing more important in life than that. Uh, advice that I would give to anyone seeking a career in professional wrestling, um, the, the, the biggest piece of advice I would give anybody looking for a career in professional wrestling is uh, have something very strong to fall back on. Or going further, um, make your pursuit of professional wrestling a sideline. Uh, especially right now, it's so difficult because technically, there's really only one game in town, which is WWF. There is TNA, but uh, you know they, they don't have as large a roster, and they don't have as many opportunities as WWF alone. Um, you know they have just a couple hours of TV a week and one pay per view a month. WWF has a you know a bigger house show schedule, um, so there's more opportunities with the WWF. But even there, just the 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 amount. Uh, the, 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 the sheer lack of number of slots where somebody could come in and somebody could, you know, be a success, let alone make a living at it. Uh, it's, it's a very, very, A, it's a very, very competitive business, and B, it's also, it's, it's, it's very difficult to break into. Um, so many people have the dream 
of working in the professional wrestling industry. And I mean, I, I had that dream as well. Ever since I was a little kid, all I wanted to do was just get into a ring and wrestle one match in front of an audience. And that was my dream all growing up. It was what I always wanted to do. And I was fortunate enough to be able to realize that dream and not only you know, wrestle one match, but uh, have, a, have a, an extended run in the WWF and WCW and make a good living at it at the time. But at the end of the day, the wrestling business will chew you up and spit you out. And it's very, very difficult. There are so many guys in the wrestling industry today that are really good, good people that have so much to offer, not only the wrestling industry, but the, just, just the world in general. But they are so focused on the wrestling industry that they're completely ignoring the fact that it's ruining their lives, that they don't have the opportunities that they'd like to have, that they're not going to make it the way that they think they deserve to and the way that in a lot of in a lot of instances that they do deserve to you get so focused on the dream that you tend to forget about reality so the 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 advice that i would have is if you have the dream and you want to pursue it pursue it but keep an air of realism about you don't put your life on hold because you're going to walk away with not much to show for it, chances are, 99% uh, of the time. As far as backyard wrestling, when I was a kid, I used to wrestle in my backyard too. Me and my buddies, would, we'd throw down an old mattress and we'd pretend we were wrestlers and come out and pretend wrestle, professional wrestling style. The difference is we weren't, jumping off of garage roofs. We weren't putting each other through tables. We weren't breaking fluorescent light tubes over each other's heads. And that type of stupidity, in my opinion, um, A, is not going to impress anybody at the WWF who is hiring anybody. So the fact that Mick Foley jumped off a garage roof when he was a kid uh, and that footage got shown in the WWF, that's not how he got into the WWF. He got into the WWF by paying his dues in the independent circuit and then moving on to WCW and then ECW and then into WWF. But if you think that you are going to impress anybody by jumping off a roof or going through the windshield of a car or, or taking a bump on, on, on a thousand thumbtacks, that's not, anybody who's an idiot can do that. What you need to do is you need to go to a school that can train you as a wrestler. Because even though you watch it on TV, and even though you understand more or less, or you think you do, understand the concept of how to work a match, there are so many things that you don't know that you can't pick up by just watching it. And you're doing yourself a disservice if you truly have this dream by not pursuing it formally. Find a gym that you can get trained at, or find someone who can train you, who has a history in the industry, and learn the right way. And then if you still wanna do it, give it a shot. But again, like I said, don't, don't forget to have something to fall back on. Have a good job, have a good sideline, get an education. That's the most important thing that you can do. And if you don't do that, you're going to find yourself in the same situation that a lot of guys are in now because there's no more WCW, there's no more competition, and there are you know, a fraction of the opportunities and jobs to make a living in this industry. So it would be much better for you to have something to fall back on if you find yourself in that same boat that a lot of guys are in now. I watched some of the early shows when uh, the WWF acquired WCW, maybe the first one or two, um, not much. But um, I, I could tell early on from a creative perspective, uh, from a storyline perspective, I could just tell from the get-go that they dropped the ball. Um, let, let me just say it's not the way that I would have done it. Not that my way would have been the right way. 
but there was just so much of a history there between the two companies and and the Monday Night Wars and the Vince McMahon versus Ted Turner, uh, Vince McMahon versus Eric Bischoff. There was so much richness there. And again, I use this word over and over, but there was so much reality there and there was so much reality to draw from that was never drawn from. And, and, and I couldn't understand it because you didn't have to write a story. The story was already there. And, um, you know, a, a, again, as a wrestling fan at the time, um, it, it was very disappointing to me because they, they really had the opportunity to do something special. And, uh, you know, again, in my opinion, I just feel they missed the mark. When the WWF, or at this point, when the WWE purchased WCW, um, it was, you know, it was a huge surprise to everybody involved or, you know, everybody that I was speaking to at the time. The, and, and I've got to speculate on that a little bit because prior to that, Eric Bischoff and Fusion were in the process of purchasing WCW. And at that time, I was one of the few people prior to that who knew that this purchase was going down with Eric and Fusion. Um, and I had been in that particular loop for several months, like since October or November the previous year. Um, and I remember that the purchase was all but going through and just using round numbers, say, I think it was something like, you know, for, for like 50, 50 million dollars or, or something like that, that the purchase was going through. I don't remember the exact figures for towards Fusion. Now, Fusion was in the due diligence process when they were looking at all of WCW's books and going through all the paperwork. And it's a process that takes some time. But I remember the process took one week, two weeks, three weeks. And I was talking to Eric during this time. And he kept assuring me that, you know, it's just taking a little longer, taking a little longer, taking a little longer. Then we all know what happened. Then Turner, Turner Networks canceled WCW programming. And all of a sudden, WCW wasn't as viable and as valuable a commodity because it didn't have the time slot anymore. As a result, Fusion backed out of the purchase. And then WWE swooped in and purchased it at a drastically reduced price uh, something like five million dollars or something like that. Again, I, I don't know the, 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 the exact figures, but I do know that it was almost 10 times less what Fusion was going to purchase it for. Now, obviously, Fusion was uh, looking to purchase something that also had a TV outlet as well. So WWE swooped in, purchased it for a bargain basement uh, price. But what raised my eyebrows was the due diligence process for the WWE, apparently, to the best of my knowledge and what I had read on the internet and, and various, various news sources, the, the due diligence process only took about a week. Uh, now, that made me and other people raise their eyebrows. Was this a deal that just happened right off the bat? Or was this deal in the works for a long time prior? Uh, was Eric Bischoff being strung along, Eric Bischoff and Fusion being strung along? Um, you may never know the answers to those questions, but uh, the one thing I will know is it definitely, it definitely smelled a little funny because of the fact that you know, their due diligence process only took about a week, whereas Fusion was strung along for numerous weeks um, with no end in sight, apparently. When WWF purchased WCW, my first thought was, um, my first thought was for myself because I knew I wasn't going to be going back to the WWF. Um, I had no interest in going back. If I, 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 matter of fact, I told the attorneys for WCW um, that if I had any interest in going back there, that uh, I would never have left. And the the problem was my contract was assignable at the time, and they could have they could have required me to uh, to see through the balance of my contract under them. Luckily, uh, the WCW attorneys worked it so that uh, I didn't have to go to the WWF, uh, which I was very thankful for because I would have walked away from the balance of my contract anyway because, like I said, I had no desire to go back there. So that was my first thought was, 
what am I going to do now? And then my second thought was about the boys and about the industry because with that one purchase, the WWF, in my opinion, um, put a, maybe not the final nail, but put a nail in the coffin of the wrestling industry by eliminating competition. Without competition, uh, you, you, you don't have a horse race. And I, I, I know, you know, just knowing the people involved, they probably assumed that, you know, we were doing about, say, an average of a three or a two, even a 2.5, say. We had a core audience in WCW of 2.5 rating points. And I'm sure WWF thought or WWE thought that, well, we'll buy them and then that 2.5 will come over and watch our product now because they won't have anything else to watch. But lo and behold, the numbers never went up. And as a result of that, you know, the, the, a, a good section, cross-section of the wrestling audience just went away because they weren't interested in watching the WWE's product. If they had been, they would have. Um, but, uh, and as a result of that, a lot of fans were alienated. Um, and it's had repercussions, serious repercussions on the industry. Um, as far as the boys are concerned, there's no place for them to go. It's either WWF or nowhere. And without that incentive on the part of the company and on the part of the boys, you're going to just kind of stagnate. And I think that, uh, in my opinion, I think that the WWF purchasing WCW is one of the worst things that's ever happened to the wrestling industry. Um, it's sad, but, uh, you know, I mean, the numbers are there to prove it. The, the numbers haven't come back up in a long, long time. I think part of the problem with guaranteed contracts and part of the problem with talent and contracts in general um, goes back to the origins of professional wrestling. And, you know, in the original days of wrestling, promoters set up the business in such a way that they make all the money. Um, and, and a lot of times the wrestlers were almost treated as meat and almost treated as individuals to um, just make the promoter the money. And uh, in that situation, what they did early on was, and they still do today, was they, they signed the talent to independent contracts before we got into the big contracts, and I'll get into that in a minute. But the rule of thumb, more or less, they're independent contractors. And what that does immediately is that pits the wrestlers against each other. And that is where the paranoia comes in and the backstabbing comes in and the lying comes in and the cheating comes in and doing anything you have to do to get ahead because the business is not set up and never was set up as a family environment. It is set up as every man for himself. And that was the aspect of the wrestling business that I never liked. That was the aspect of the wrestling business that I think desperately, desperately needs to change. But the reality of it is, as long as it's handled like a wrestling business, and as long as there are still promoters involved, because there are, that aspect of it will never change. Um, I believe strongly that there should be a union and, and the wrestlers should have a union and the wrestlers should get uh, uh, health benefits and the wrestlers should get dental and they should make sure their families are taken care of. Uh, there should be some kind of drug rehab. There should be all these things. But, but the problem is the wrestlers are too afraid. They're, they're, they're too afraid to unite because they may lose their spot or they may lose their position. And this is the exact environment that the promoters have created. This is exactly what they want these guys to think because the last thing they want is for these guys to join forces together. And you know, as I said, um, that's an aspect of the wrestling business that I, I, I disdain. Uh, I, I hate it with a passion. I don't believe these guys are taken care of. On the other side of that coin, you know, WCW, Turner, they went a different route where they gave these guys ca guaranteed contracts X amount of dollars, paid them huge sums of money, 
um, uh, 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 much of which some didn't deserve, you know, if, if we're going to be honest here. And basically what they did is they created prima donnas. You know, all of a sudden these guys were making so much money that, you know, they had the power and they were calling the shots. So, you know, that was to the extreme and it wasn't working on that front either. I, I think what we need to do is meet somewhere in the middle. But I can only hope and pray that someday the wrestling business is treated like a business and, and the workers and the guys aren't taken advantage of and, and they are treated like decent human beings and they are treated like fathers and, you know, they, they are treated with respect and the responsibility of having to raise a family. And, um, you know, again, I, I stated earlier my opinion on the wrestling business and that, you know, at my core and at my heart, you know, the first thing that comes from my mouth is that I hate it. And, and, and when I say that, this is the main reason. Um, I just hate the way guys are pitted against each other. And, and, and I just hate the way that, in my opinion, these guys just aren't treated like employees should be treated. A lot of people point to the guaranteed contracts that so many of the boys had in WCW as one of the factors that brought about the downfall of the company. Now that, that was a company that had, had almost you know, numerous, uh, numerous uh, uh, factors that led to its downfall. And the guaranteed contracts, I feel, was one of them. For example, uh, I'll explain the difference. In WWF, um, wrestlers would get what is called a minimum downside guarantee, which is the absolute minimum amount of money a wrestler can make over the course of a year. Uh, for example, let's just say that it's a, it's a lower downside guarantee and the wrestler is making like sixty to $75,000 over the course of the year. That is what they are guaranteed to walk away with. Now, the way that the contracts are structured in WWE, the reason it's called a minimum downside guarantee is because there are incentives. If the wrestler goes out and really gets over with the fans, becomes extremely popular, wrestles, works, works his or her way up to wrestling, you know, main events, semi-main events on pay-per-views, gets a lot of TV time, sells merchandise. That's a huge factor in wrestlers' salaries. If they can move a lot of merchandise, they get a percentage of that merchandise. Um, if they can essentially work themselves up to the point where they are putting asses in seats, now that is where the wrestlers make more than their minimum downside guarantee. Uh, like a wrestler who, say, has a downside guarantee of $75,000, if they become really over with the fans and wrestle some prominent matches, have high, high roles on pay-per-views, and also move a lot of merchandise, well, that wrestler could make a quarter of a million dollars over one year, maybe even a half a million dollars, maybe even more, uh, just by nature of the fact that they are earning money for the company. When you have a structure like that, the wrestlers are inspired to go out and to do a good job. There is incentive there for them to go out and do the best job they can, get over with the fans. If the wrestler gets over with the fans, the product gets over with the fans. That's why the WWF's, WWE's contract structure, I think, works for this particular industry. Now, flip to WCW and the way that their contracts are, are, were structured, their guaranteed contracts. You had wrestlers working for that company who had guaranteed contracts of hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. Now, they were guaranteed that money regardless of whether they put on five-star matches or went out and stunk the joint up, whether they sold millions of dollars in merchandise or whether they didn't make dime one for the merchandise arm of the company. So as a result of that, there was absolutely no incentive for the wrestlers, especially the ones up top, to go out and bust their butts and put on the best matches they could and keep the audiences on the edges of their seat. There was no incentive to do that when they could just go out there, phone it in. And I'm not saying they all did that, but there was always the, case, the cases where some of the boys would do it um, or there would be threats that they would do it go out, phone it in, put on a half-assed match, and what happens? The fans get upset and pissed off. The fans get turned away, turned off by the product. And as a result of that, we are stuck with huge six-figure contracts that aren't earning their keep for the company. And they're, with a guaranteed contract, 
there's nothing you can do. So uh, I really feel that the way that the WWF structures their contracts is much more effective because then you have the boys who are hungry are going to go out there and they are going to get paid based on the quality of the work they do. Whereas in WCW, the problem was so many of the boys got paid based on nothing more than the deal they were able to negotiate for themselves. And there was no incentive for them to shine. I mainly got involved in TNA because Jeff Jarrett's a very good friend of mine and I wanted to help a friend. And I thought it would be different because we were such close friends. But um, the reality of it was, it was still the wrestling business. And the wrestling business is the wrestling business. And as long as you have key people in key spots, that is not going to change. So I was in a situation where it was more or less the same old, same old. And I got to be honest, and, and again, just speaking from my heart, but my feeling is, unless that changes, and unless the wrestling business comes up to speed with the rest of society, it's not going to exist. Because in a lot of ways, it, it is barbaric to the way it, it treats the talent. And um, I think the wrestling business is killing the wrestling business. And whether it's WWE, uh, TNA, it, it really doesn't matter because some changes need to be made uh, to bring it up to 2005, to make it you know, fair for the, for the wrestlers, to, to put a product out there that the, uh, the viewer can relate to. And unless these changes are made, um, I, I really believe that the business is going gonna, is gonna to die a slow death. And I, I think the only thing that's going to change that is to get some new blood in there and to get some, some people in there with new, fresh ideas and to try to you know, do away with those protecting their spots that have been doing the same thing or conducting business the same way as they have for the last you know, 20 or 30 years. That's what's hurting the business. And quite frankly, um, I, I don't see it changing. Um, I, I've been in it for 13, 14 years. You know, it is what it is. And um, I just don't know what it would take to ever, ever see the business change. I was first contacted um, by Jeff Jarrett to come into TNA uh, a few months before they started up. Uh, I was in, actually, I, was, I, I had just gotten to the point in my life where I'd finally given up on the wrestling business and I was looking to start something new. Uh, and I thought the video editing might be a good way to go. Um, so I was taking a, a video editing course uh, boot camp in Portland, Oregon. It was a six-week program, and I was in the fifth week of the six-week program, and I got a call from Jeff Jarrett basically asking me if I would, because he heard that I was editing now, and he asked me if I would come aboard TNA, told me about the, 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 the whole project, asked me if I would be the color announcer on, on air, and also if I would supervise the post-production process. So for me, this was a no-brainer because it kind of, the way I was looking at it, it looking at it, it would be a transition out of wrestling eventually uh, by having me work post-production. Um, didn't work out that way, uh, but the bottom line was uh, I moved to Nashville and was there uh, from the very beginning up through, up through the very end of August of that first summer that they were around. Um, do I think that it was a good idea to do the pay-per-views every week. Um, I believe that the original business plan for TNA, which was you know weekly 995 pay-per-views, was pretty much the only way uh, a new promotion could really get off the ground at the level that they wanted to get off. I mean, they 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 didn't want to be uh, you know one of these fly-by-night organizations that you know is airs at three in the morning on uh, local cable access. I mean, there was some level of star power that they had and they wanted, to, they wanted to present it appropriately. And unless you've got somebody that's willing to, 
to plunk down huge bucks and oodles of cash to start something off with a splash like that, the pay-per-view only, pro, uh, pay-per-view only um, concept, I think, was the only way to go. Also, just the bottom line, the WCW was gone. WWF's numbers were sinking, and the, the, the bottom line was nobody in TV, no networks, no channels, no stations, were looking to jump on board with wrestling. A few years earlier, wrestling was red hot, and anybody would have leapt at the chance. But now, at this point in time, wrestling was no longer hot, so the weekly pay-per-views was pretty much the only way this, this, this show could get on the air on the national level. Uh, because none, nobody else would be willing to to back it and and put it on their network. Um, I left TNA the end of that August, uh, last week in August, first week in September, um, and uh, I felt badly about the way it had to happen. But um, the long story short was that an investor had pulled out of the uh, of the company. Um, I think that was on a Thursday, and I found out about it on a Friday. And Jeff came into my office, and uh, you know he he felt horrible about it, and I felt horrible for him to be in that position. But he had to basically go around and tell us in the office that uh, as a result of this investor pulling out, that there 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 was no payroll that week. Um, you know they were going to do everything in their power, and they were going to get that money uh, and pay us for the work that we had been doing. But uh, he didn't have it that day. Um, and I think that at that moment in time, that's when I realized, you know what, I'm done. Because my logic was, even if they did get another investor, which they obviously did, they're still, in, they're still, you know, they're still doing well to this day. But in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, there's no telling that this won't happen again and again, and again, and again. And I was just tired of the uncertainty. And I was tired of the roller coaster ride. And, um, you know, I like excitement as much as the next guy, but uh, I don't need that kind of excitement in my life anymore. So I think that was a moment when I realized that I was pretty much done. Uh, And I told Jeff that, you know, give me a call when he gets the problems worked out. And to his credit, he called me two days later and basically said, we've got a new investor, and we've got another one lined up. We've got payroll for last week. We've got your check cut. Everything's good. Um, and at that point, I told him, you know, I, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. I've had a great time working here, but uh, I think this is where I need to get off. I'm going to use this break to get off, get off the, the roller coaster. Um, and uh, I don't regret it at all. I don't regret any of the time that I spent with him, nor do I regret leaving the company when I did. Um, you know, there's been, I've, I've heard things about, you know, rats leaving a stinking sh- a sinking ship, but uh, it wasn't that at all. It was a matter of self-preservation. And I was not about to work 80 hours, potentially, which some of my weeks were 80 hours when I was working for that company. And uh, at the end of the week, you know, maybe getting paid. Um, my logic was always, well, if I want to do that, I could do that from the privacy of my own, own home. So, and that was the last time I worked in the wrestling industry. Um, had a lot of fun doing it, but I'm, I'm glad I got off when I did. Again, un- unless the changes are made, I don't think it's going to be a healthy business. And unless you have somebody come in with a whole new different perspective and a a whole new way of looking at things, um, I I don't see somebody competing with the WWE and I don't see the WWE doing, you know, very well, you know, with their rating as well. Um, Again, this is an industry right now that really needs to be looked at. Um, you, you can't do things the same way you've been doing them 20, 30 years ago. It's not working. Uh, you look at the numbers, it's obviously not working. Um, changes can be made. It, it can be made better. It can be brought up to speed. It can draw 6 million people again a week. There's no doubt in my mind. But, you know, unfortunately, again, 
when we talk about the nature of the beast and we talk about those protecting their spots, I, I just don't see it opening up to, um, to form competition and, and to make the business healthy again. Um, I, I just don't see it. Will the WWE ever have equal competition again? Um, in my opinion, I would love to be able to say yes, absolutely, but I can't say that at this point. There's no absolutes. Uh, I think that it's very possible in the sense that anything is possible, but right now the closest competition is TNA, and they're just the, the, two, the two brands are just light years away when you talk about WWE with their Raw and SmackDown brands and TNA. I mean, TNA doesn't even run house shows. All they have is their TV. Now, eventually, hopefully, they will be doing house shows. And then there will be more opportunities for paydays for the wrestlers. And they will get more guys to come in there. And they will have a more impressive roster. And eventually, slowly but surely, their awareness will, will expand. And maybe they will be able to challenge WWE. Um, the thing that I'm afraid of is if the WWE continues to decline numbers-wise, you know, if they are going to go down to the levels of, of uh, the next best contender, as opposed to the next best contender rising to the WWE's level. Um, that's what frightens me. Um, I don't really watch WWE anymore. I, I haven't watched it in years. Um, but I do keep, in, keep up on what's going on on their TV because I just want to see uh, and, and know what kind of storylines they're doing, what kind of characters they're doing. And um, I would really love to see WWE really regain that edge that it's had in the past and become that hot prospect, that hot topic of conversation once again. Uh, something needs to be done the, 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 for the industry, I think, to survive. Because right now, I think the industry is doing just that. It's just surviving, but it's not thriving by any stretch of the imagination. So um, do I think that there will be competition at the level of WWE? I would like to think so, but I don't know. At this point, I don't know where it's going to come from. Uh, TNA is the only logical competition right now, but you know, uh, until they start expanding even more, they can't even hope to compete on the same level as WWE as far as awareness goes. I'm hoping it'll happen uh, for the good of the industry and for the good of the boys, but... Whether or not it will remains to be seen. You know, it's funny, but a lot of people don't understand how much 9-11 changed professional wrestling. And, and, and but let me explain that because it's clear as day to me. What, why others don't see it, I, I don't understand. But all of a sudden... The entire world sees visions of two jet airliners smacking in to the World Trade Centers. And we saw those visions over and over and over again. And those visions were ingrained in our minds. Um, it doesn't get any more real than that. On top of that, you know, you have war in, in Iraq. Um, you, you have so much reality going on right now where they bring you to the battlefield. Um, we, we've seen so much as a society that there's nothing that can shock us anymore. I mean, if you know, like I said, beyond 9-11, what do you do to top that? The problem is, as these things continue to come into television and continue to come into our li living rooms, you know, at the same time, you're turning over to a channel and you're seeing a guy in a cowboy hat and a guy in a, wearing a crown, you know, blatantly trying to convince us that something fake is real. And what the end result is, is, is that you have people laughing at your product. And they're laughing at you because what you're doing now is you are insulting the intelligence of the audience. The, the, the solution is simple. You've got to make the stories as close to reality as possible. 
you've got to take these wrestlers and you've got to draw from their personal backgrounds, who they are, what they're going through, married, divorced, kids, no kids, um, you know, uh, whatever their background was at, at children. You've got to draw from the reality of the situation. You've got to draw from the reality of their lives. You've got to have storylines that everyday people can relate to. Um, in other words, if I'm writing the WWF television right now, the main story is Triple H and Stephanie are married. Okay, Triple H, the top star, is married to the boss's daughter who's head of creative. It doesn't get any better than that. That's the story, that's reality, and everything needs to come off of that. On top of that, another huge problem is what we're seeing in the ring. These matches need to look real. Um, I, I think in TNA, the X Division does a great job with this. Um, the, the, the moves need to be succinct with each other. I, I don't think we can anymore, you know, throw powder in the eyes or miss the clothesline by six feet or, you know, put somebody in the figure four and that stuff doesn't work anymore. I mean, people want to see fights. People want to be able to believe what they see. So I think it's really a combination of the, the in-ring product where these guys have been laying out their matches the same way for the last 10 years. That needs to change and add that to the reality of the storylines and give the audience something that they can bite their teeth into, not something we've seen played and replayed over in the wrestling business a hundred times before. I think that the future of this business is one that the audience needs to be re-energized. Um, there are a lot of wrestling fans that don't watch anymore, and a lot of mainstream viewers don't watch anymore. When WWF was at its peak, uh, there was a huge mainstream audience, not, not wrestling fans at all, um, but WWF became like the hot water cooler topic. Uh, on Tuesday mornings. What the industry needs to do, uh, my opinion, get back to basics. Um, we had that whole spate going through the, you know, the, the late 90s all the way up until the early 2000s, late 90s when I was in WWE, WWF, when I was in WCW, um, when we were focusing on the storylines. We were focusing on creating captivating, interesting characters and putting them in believable, edgy uh, storylines, or flip, flip that and putting them in outlandish storylines. But regardless, it was the storylines that were captivating the audience. The, the matches that we were booking were coming from the storylines, as opposed to vice versa, when you will figure out what the match is, then, okay, what's the storyline we can have building up to that? We need to get back to basics in this industry. We need to, and, and not just characters and storylines, although that, although that is key, but it seems to me that the, the industry needs to be almost reinvented in a certain way. For years and years and years and years, the wrestling business was somewhat of a mystery. Uh, you know, a lot of people knew somehow it was faked, but they didn't know how, and they didn't know to what extent. Um, and it was never discussed. And then uh, came, you know, the late 90s when basically all cards were on the table and it's no longer World Wrestling Federation, it's World Wrestling Entertainment. And we're not wrestling, we're sports entertainment. And we kind of embraced the fact that that's what we were, that we weren't wrestling, that we were entertainment. We were about storylines and characters. Um, but what I think needs to happen is we need to go back and reestablish the core, which is the wrestling, which is the pursuit of the championships, which is the rules of the ring. And if we go back and reinvent and go back to those basics and then build the stories on top of them, I think that that might be a start for being able to reattract audience members that may have gone away. Um, that's the first order of business. We need to make it believable again. We need to make the fans who are jaded at this point, they've seen it all, nothing impresses them. 
We have to figure out what it is that will impress them, that will knock them off, off, off their asses. And I'm not talking about necessarily crash TV, and I'm not talking about breaking kayfabe. I'm just talking about figuring out what it is that could make wrestling reattract itself to those fans and making it real again. Make the fans mark out. I don't know what that is specifically, but that, I think, is that philosophy is at the foundation of what needs to be done. You know, it's funny because I'll never forget um, when I first uh, got in the wrestling business, which was probably about 91, there was still some level of kayfabe. I remember one of the first shows I ever uh, worked on. It was my first show ever. And I walked into a locker room and two guys were going over a match and there was a third guy. And as soon as I walked in, you know, the guy said to the other two, kayfabe, kayfabe, because they didn't know who I was. And quite honestly, that was probably the last time I heard the term used in the business. <clears throat> the truth is, it wasn't me that changed the wrestling business. The, the wrestling business was changing before Vince Russo ever became a writer. And that was largely due to the internet. Um, you know, on the internet now, you could read uh, what was going to happen at the next TV, what was happening behind the scenes, who was getting along with who, who didn't like who, who was sleeping with who. This was starting to pour out all over the internet, and, and people now were really starting to understand behind the scenes of the wrestling business. And no matter how long the WWF wanted to keep things kayfabe, the fact of the matter was the cat was out of the bag. And, um, you know, as the internet grew and as more people became smarter and smarter to the business, it, it was very important that we no longer could ins insult those people. We now had to deal with those people and basically say, okay, we understand that you get it. And we're not going to try to fool you anymore. We're not going to try to take advantage of you anymore. We're not going to try to lie you any to you anymore. All we're going to try to do is give you the best possible product we can and, and try to suspend the disbelief, you know, through the show and through the reality. But, um, you know, again, uh, you know, kayfabe, I, 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 I would have been interesting to be around in the 80s. Um, but, um, you know, like I said, the, the, the Internet just threw that whole concept out the window. Kayfabe is uh, a very interesting uh, concept because it's what kept the wrestling business alive for so very many years. And now it's almost the thing that is, it's almost resented by the fans, by the fact that anybody who would keep kayfabe, anybody who would, you know, you know, keep alive that, try to keep alive the illusion that it's all real um, is obviously must be stuck, you know, in the 50s and 60s. Um, the problem with the wrestling industry in general is for so long we, we talked about the wrestling bubble. Because of kayfabe, the wrestlers were able to kind of, uh, shit, I'm starting again. We can just keep rolling. Uh, the concept of kayfabe is so outdated nowadays um, that, uh, let me start again. Nowadays, the concept of kayfabe is very outdated. It's common knowledge, like I said earlier, with the fact that WWF changed its name to, to World Wrestling Entertainment, Sports Entertainment. Uh, we, you know, we've all but come out and said, hey, this is not real. This is a show. This is entertainment. These are characters. These are storylines. We have said all of those things. So that, I think, was the first major step towards keeping the business thriving. When you had the advent of the Internet, which prior to the, the, the you know, mid-90s was not as prevalent as it is today, and you have the, the sheets, like the Observer, and the Torch, and the Lariat, and what have you. You have information about what goes on behind the scenes 
that is getting out to the people who want to find out what's going on behind the scenes. And it's like anything else in Hollywood. You've got all the gossip columnists writing about what's really going on behind the scenes between Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. So the fans of the, of the wrestling industry, they want to find out what's going on behind the scenes too. And you can't keep that information from getting out. Now, the problem is, for the longest time, especially in the WWF, and I'm sure in WCW, we fought it for the longest time, and it was an uphill, impossible battle. Uh, trying to keep finishes from getting out on the internet for shows that were taped. It's never going to happen. Try and get information, trying to keep information from being leaked out and everybody knowing what's coming up or some big name that's being brought in as a surprise. It's going to happen. So I think that for the longest time, what, what was potentially very detrimental was uh, that that was being ignored for a while. Oh, the internet, that's only, that's not even 5% of our audience. But now it's becoming very clear that the internet fans are a huge portion of the audience. And I believe that, that, that the, uh, because there is really no more kayfabe anymore, uh, that that needs to be embraced. It needs to be utilized as much as possible. The problem is the wrestling industry has always, at least for me as a fan, one of the things that always got me as a fan was the element of surprise, of being shocked, of seeing something that I didn't expect to see. The first match I ever saw uh, in its entirety was the match where Larry Zbysko hit Bruno San Martino in the head with a chair. Now, if you know this story, that it was a huge deal at that point. Nobody saw it coming, and I certainly didn't see it coming. And as a result of that, I never stopped watching wrestling because I was afraid I was going to miss something equally as cool because I didn't know it was coming. Now, with the internet, it's so much harder to surprise the audience. It's so much harder to make the fans mark out over what's being done. What does that do? It challenges us. It challenges us to be cleverer, to come up with more interesting, creative ways to do these things. But to react negatively about the internet, and to, to, you know, to basically cut off that segment of your audience, I believe, is cutting off your nose to spite your face. You need to embrace it. The Internet needs to be embraced as a medium of, of not, only, not only advertising your product, but also educating people about your product and gaining new audience members. Um, it's not going away. The Internet isn't a fad. It's not going away. The sheets aren't going away. They're not a fad. So they're out there, embrace the fact that they're out there and try and make the best of it. Challenge yourself to come up with more interesting, surprising things. And it's very difficult coming from one of the guys who was in charge of coming up with a lot of these surprises. It's very difficult when you've got something big planned for the pay-per-view and you don't want to show up the night of the pay-per-view and have to rethink your plan because somebody involved in it doesn't want to go along with it. So we would have to call the boys in advance and run past them what we were planning on doing. Now, every now and then, some information that we were discussing with them in advance in confidentiality would end up on the internet or would end up in the sheets. You can't do anything about that. I don't know what you can do. But it, it just, all you can do is let it give you an ulcer. But it's a fact of life. And until we, ha we get back to those, that incentive for everybody to work harder and competition in the industry is something that would, that would go a long way to establishing that. Until we get back to that incentive, there's, there's no telling that somebody won't be able to you know, make a phone call and have information end up on the internet that you don't want out there. You know, it's funny because when you ask me that question, I mean, I have a few mixed feelings. Um, one, one of the feelings is that there's a big part of me that misses Vince McMahon. And there's a big part of me that still doesn't feel right about the way 
the situation ended. Um, there, there's a big part of me that wants to be his friend. There's a big part of me that still wants to have conversations with him because as, as a man and as a person, I, I really admire Vince. Now, on the other side of that coin, I don't expect him to feel the same way. Um, Vince has a business to run. So, you know, when somebody leaves his company, it's, you know, it's probably more or less on to the next guy. Uh, but with me, you know, there is a place in my heart for Vince. Um, the state of wrestling today, the way it is right now, I don't think I could ever go back to the, to the WWF. Um, but I also don't want to say never. And the reason why I don't want to say never is because after going down this road and after going through this journey of 15 years and after, you know, coming to the point of, of, of me reaching rock bottom and the end of my life, uh, you know, God interjected. And, and, and he basically said to me loud and clear, are you ready to listen to me now? Uh, you know, Vince, you're 42 years old. You've been doing everything your way. It's been all about you. And 42 years later, here you are. I, I let you do it. I let you make the decisions. I let you make the calls. And here you are. And are you ready to listen to me now? And at that point, you know, I turned my life over to God because I knew I failed. And I made more money than I ever dreamed of. I reached a level of success higher than I ever dreamed of, more than I ever set my goals on. I had it all. But the reality of it was that I was absolutely miserable because there was something missing from my life that I couldn't put my finger on. And I kept trying to fill the void with a higher rating or more accolades or more money. But it wasn't doing the job. And the reason why it wasn't doing the job was because all the glory was going to me. It was, it was <clears throat> self-glorification on my part, and I was doing nothing to glorify the person responsible for all this and for my life, and that was God. So about 16 months ago, I made the decision to hand my life over to Him. And I don't drive the boat anymore. I don't make the decisions anymore. I don't dictate my future anymore. It is all in his hands. Um, I know he's got a plan for me, and I am going to seek that plan out. So I can't sit here and tell you, no, I would never go to the WWF again, because I don't know what that plan is. Um, but what I will say is that's not for me to decide. Um, it's beyond me. But, um, you know, like I said, there, there's still this, there, there's still something that doesn't sit right with me about the relationship with Vince. And um, I don't know what that is. I don't know why that is. And, and, and I just hope that one day uh, God will show me what that is and I will be able to put a period at the end of that story. Under any circumstances, would I go back to the WWE? Um, sure, under the right circumstances. Um, and for me, the right circumstances are circumstances that I sincerely doubt would ever be offered me. Um, let's just say that I would go back to the WWE if their offer to me was lucrative enough and flexible enough that I wouldn't feel like I was putting my life on hold to go do what I do for them once again. Um, so I guess indirectly, the answer to the question is no, because I sincerely doubt that they would ever offer me the offer that I would need in order to accept it, um, which is fine. That's fine with me. I'm very happy doing what I'm doing right now. You know, that, that my legacy, it's, it, it's very hard for me to answer because, you know, there's two Vinces, and there was the Vince before I was saved, and there was the Vince now. 
And um, the Vince now knows it's not my legacy and it never was my legacy. It's God's legacy and, it, and, and it's whatever his plan was and whatever he wanted to achieve through me. That, that's what this is all about. And it's always been about that. I just never understood that. Um, you know, again, I just, I, I just want to be the person he wants me to be. If that means uh, bringing wrestling to a Christian front and, and, and doing some type of Christian wrestling where these athletes are not glorifying themselves, but they're glorifying Him, and they're glorifying Him for the gifts that He gave them. If that's the avenue He wants me to go down, then that's the avenue I'll go down. But I can't tell you what that legacy is because it's not for me to determine. Because all I am is, I am a vehicle, and I am a vehicle for Him to use me. And, and however He decides to use me, then that is His legacy, it's not mine. Um, if anything, I would want, I would want my legacy uh, to be that I was part of the creative team that provided a lot of really innovative and exciting programming and storytelling to a lot of fans. Um, I had a great time doing that. Uh, I know a lot of people had a great time watching it and just the fact that the work that I did was enjoyed by a lot of people, um, that's reward in and of itself. Beyond that, I would like to be remembered as a nice guy who wasn't always in the right place at the right time and tried his hardest and worked really hard for the companies that he worked for. I'm the kind of guy who I like to show up to work, smile a lot, and do my job. Um, and most days I was able to do that in the wrestling industry. So for that, I enjoyed that, and I wouldn't mind being remembered for that too. You know, life after wrestling, it's, um, it's tough because, you know, when, when I sit here and I tell you for 42 years I drove the car and for 42 years I was in control of my life, I always knew what that next step was. I always had a game plan. I always had goals. Um, I never stopped short of my goals. Um, that's the way I was my whole life. I mean, that's the way I was. I, I, I'll never forget when I was 16 years old. Uh, you know, there was a girl I wanted to go out with that wouldn't go out with me because she thought she was better than me. And that, that was where it started. So, you know, again, when we look at Vince before he was saved, you're talking about 26 years of a guy that wrote his own ticket and 23 years of a guy that, that, that dictated the direction and that knew where he was going to go. Um, I was in control, you know, and, and, and the reality is, you know, I messed up. Um, th there are people, a lot of people, um, the majority of the people that think that money will make them happy. I made $535,000 in my best year at WCW, and it was by far the most miserable I was. And, and you think the things that, you know, you think in, in this real world, certain things are going to make you happy, and once you achieve these things, you find out that they're not. So it's, you ask about life after wrestling, and I don't have a plan. I mean, for the first time in my life, I don't have a plan. Um, what I do now on a daily basis is I try to strengthen my relationship with God. I, I try to do that through prayer, um, through studying His Word, and I try to do that through making a conscious, conscious effort to every single day 
live the life that he wants me to live. Um, and I know that once I get these things in line, um, and once I can align myself up with him, I know that he's going to show me the way. And I know that he's going to make things clear to me because he's already done that. So um, I don't know where this road goes. And I'm not going to try to guess. You know, for the first time in my life, as I said, it's not up to me. Um, I've handed it over. I mean, I made the mistake about, and I mentioned this in the interview, I made the mistake of at one time handing my life over to Vince McMahon. And what I did was I handed my life over to man. I handed my life over to society. And it was probably the biggest mistake I made in my life. So now I've handed my life over to where it needs to go, and that's to God. So wh wherever he takes me from this point on is his will and not mine. Uh, about two years ago, I moved to Chicago uh, with no real plan. And uh, my wife and I just wanted to move here because we really dug the city. And one thing led to another, and I ended up teaching first at the Second City Training Center, and then at Columbia College, Chicago, University of Chicago, Northeastern Illinois University, one thing after another. And um, that's my life after wrestling. I'm doing a lot of teaching. I'm teaching writing, comedy writing, TV and sitcom writing, teaching TV producing. Um, and I love it. Uh, it's so incredibly rewarding to be able to work with these students and be able to pass on the bits and pieces that I've gleaned over the course of my career. And then couple that with the fact that I'm finally able to do my own writing again. I started working on a novel a little while ago and I hope to have it finished by the end of the year. Um, I said that last year, I'm saying it again this year. And uh, I've just rediscovered the joy of writing and working on the novel. I'm working on another book at the same time. And it's, uh, it's incredibly rewarding to be able to write and be creative on my own uh, without somebody looking over my shoulder, without somebody screaming for deadlines, um, to be able to write what I want to write at my pace and the way I want to do it. So life after wrestling for me is uh, a lot simpler and I like it that way. I'm doing, I'm teaching and I'm writing and those are two things that I love to do. So I'm happy, which is good. Uh, one thing that I'm really proud of, um, is, is a book I wrote, um, and the name of the book is Forgiven, and it's, it's on ECW Press, and it'll be out hopefully sometime in September, and I, I've got to be honest, um, this book is probably the single most important thing um, I've ever done in my life. You talk about legacy, the book is the legacy. You know, it's funny because we grow up and we all have dreams. And, uh, you know, who wants to be a basketball player? Who wants to be a wrestler? And we all have dreams. Early on, you know, the seventh grade, you know, my dream was to write a book. And uh, it, it means a lot to me that that dream came true. But what's more important to me is how the book progressed. And let me explain that to you because... Um, it's amazing, and, and, and it truly is a, an act of God. Um, when I went home from WCW, when I was suffering from the concussions, when uh, you know I, I was no longer involved in the writing, when I was at the lowest point of my life, this is probably about 1999. I'm sorry, about 2001, when, when, when the contract was running out with WCW, and I had nowhere to go, I didn't know what I was going to do. I sat down and I penned my memoirs. And it was the darkest moment of my life. And I wrote a book where I buried everybody. It was everybody else's fault. The language in the book, I, I would have never allowed my own 
kids to go anywhere near this book. Um, the, the language, I mean, I held nothing back because at that point in time, that's what I felt in my heart. And, and that's what the business had done to me. Well, the book never got published, um, but I held on to it. I, I, I held on to it because I, I could never replace that raw emotion of those words. And whether it sold or not, I wanted to be able to go back to it and really look at where I was at that point in my life. The miracle that happened was in October of uh, 2003, you know, I became saved and I became a Christian. And I had the ability to now look back at my own words when, you know, the enemy was running my life. And, and as a Christian, I was able to look at the ugliness of my words and the ugliness of my heart and my feelings and my thoughts with a whole new light and a whole new perspective. So what, what I did was I took the old memoir and I cleaned up the language and the truth was still in there, but it wasn't written in such a, a negative form. Um, it was still truthful and it was still honest, but a lot of the hostility um, w was softened a bit. And I was now able to look at myself as a saved Christian and look at who I was only two years ago and be able now seeing things, you know, through the eyes of God and seeing things crystal clear, I was able to see the type of person that I had become in the wrestling business. So what this book, Forgiven, is, is it's a journey. The original manuscript is there, but throughout that manuscript, I comment on the book as a Christian, and I comment on who I was and how I got that way. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm really able to take a long look at myself. And, you know, I've read a lot of wrestling books. And in my opinion, the majority, not all, but the majority of the wrestling books, they serve two purposes. Number one is to get the writer over. And number two is to bury everybody else. Well, in this book, I bury nobody. The person I am most critical of is me. And, and what the book is about, it's about one man's journey. And it's about a journey of, of, of self-glorification to sanctification. And this book is a gift from God. Um, they're his words. He, he spoke through me. And, and it was such a cleansing of the soul. And now I have something that I can leave behind to my children. And, and they can really know, you know, who their father was. But again, you know, I, I just thank God for, for giving me the opportunity to do that and for giving me the opportunity to experience my own words before he saved my life. And um, out of everything I've ever done, there is no doubt that this book it, it, it is the biggest accomplishment of my life. Uh, as I said before, I am working on a novel, a horror novel, which, um, you know, next to comedy horror is my favorite genre. Uh, it's what I love to read. It's what I like to write. It's the movies I like to watch. Uh, but I also, uh, also I have a website, edferrara.com, and uh, on my website, edferrara.com, uh, there's information and link to uh, a, another book that I wrote. Um, this is on edferrara.com. There's a link to a book called Dark Consequences, and it's a, a book of short stories, short horror stories that I wrote uh, a year or two ago. And uh, if you go on edferrara.com, you can check out the book, and uh, there's a link to order it. Now, the, the reason I bring this up is not to plug my website edferrara.com. I don't need to do that. I don't need to, to drive traffic to edferrara.com, E-D-F-E-R-R-A-R-A.com. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not about that. I'm not about 
I'm not about edferrara.com. Uh, it's just a small portion of what I do. I teach, I write, and then there's edferrara.com. But if you go on edferrara.com, there's all sorts of interesting links. You can email me directly, uh, ed at edferrara.com. And uh, there's, there's also information about the books. And as I continue working on my novel, I will post updates on edferrara.com as far as publishing leads or as far as what progress I'm at. So check out edferrara.com. Not because I need people to check out edferrara.com, but just because I think that edferrara.com is uh, something that people should check out.